Hi, I'm Brad Fraser. I'm Spencer Schunk. And this is Old Movies for Young People. And today we're talking about two of the great horror films of all time. We have Frankenstein from 1931 and Bride of Frankenstein from 1935. Both movies, directed by James Whale. We have a screenplay in the original by Garrett Fort and Francis Edwards Farago, but of course, these are both adapted from Mary Shelley's uh, original novel. And then our cast includes Boris Karloff. We've got Colin Clive as Dr. Henry Frankenstein, a little bit different than the book. And then as uh, the Bride of Frankenstein, of course, we've got Elsa Lanchester. Basically, a disturbed scientist is obsessed with unlocking the meaning of life and creating it for himself. Everyone around him warns him not to do it, but he goes ahead and steals bodies and builds himself a man. The brain you stole, Fritz. Think of it. The brain of a dead man, waiting to live again in a body I made with my own hands. With my own hands. And just as this is happening, his wife, who is played by Mae Clark, and their friend Victor gets involved. They run up to the castle just in time to see the lightning storm and the monster brought to life. They run away, they tell people, Frankenstein begs them not to, but of course the monster escapes and starts wreaking havoc in the countryside, kills a couple people, kills a little girl. He arrives at the Frankenstein mansion to threaten Elizabeth on the day she's about to marry Henry. <coughs> the uh, father of a little girl who was killed earlier in the film arrives carrying her in his arms and incites the town people to violence and anger. My poor man, why do you bring her here to me? She has been murdered! Yeah! They chase the monster away from town, up the hill to the windmill. A huge fight ensues. Tr Henry tries to put the monster down and uh, alleviate the horrible things he's done, but the monster throws him off of the windmill just as it is set fire, and he apparently perishes in the fire. <laughs> Now the second movie, Bride of Frankenstein, doesn't quite pick up right where we left off. We get a little bit of a weird framing device where we have uh, Elsa Lanchester playing Mary Shelley, talking to Lord Byron and Percy Shelley about writing this story. She recaps it for us. And then we come in just a bit before we learned how Henry survived after he fell off the windmill. But then we go back to the windmill. We discover that uh, the monster is still alive. <laughs> kills the parents of the little girl that he killed in the first movie, so he murders the entire family. Uno O'Connor sees it, runs back to uh, the Frankenstein Manor, tries to warn everybody, but they won't listen to her because who would? Uh, while the monster is rampaging across the country and they're looking for it, uh, Frankenstein's professor from university shows up, a very gay codified Dr. Pretorius who insists that Frankenstein must help him. He's heard about Frankenstein's success with reanimating dead matter, but he has Another technique. My first experiment was so lovely that we made her a queen. Charming, don't you think? Then, of course, we had to have a king. Now he's so madly in love with her that we have to segregate them. So meanwhile, the monster has been caught He's taken in chains, he's put in this chair, he busts out of that chair, no problem, goes on a rampage in the town itself, kills a bunch of people. He eventually ends up at this old hermit's house. He's about to get violent with the hermit, but the hermit's blind, doesn't realize that the monster is a monster. They have this beautiful touching scene where he learns how to speak. He gets over his fear of fire a little bit. Good, good. 
We are friends, you and I. Friends. Friends. <laughs> Good. Good. <laughs> and now for a smoke. However, it's all broken up when a couple of guys who are hunting him uh, come to the hermit's house. The hermit's house ends up burning down and the monster is on the loose again. And then he has to hide in a crypt where he encounters Dr. Pretorius. Very conveniently. Yeah, very. And Pretorius decides that he's going to befriend the monster and actually does it because the monster has now learned to smoke and drink wine and uh, like the things of life. Pretorius offers him those things and lists him and then goes to Frankenstein and says, we're building a bride for this monster. Yeah, and he's got the monster there as his muscle. And we also kidnap... Uh, kidnap uh, the wife again. We kidnap the wife. I don't like leaving you alone. Oh, nonsense, May. I shall be all right. I hope so, my lady. Is that you, Henry? So we finally animate the bride in much the same way we animated Frank, the monster in the first one. Frankenstein comes in, sees her, he is filled with love, he finally has what he wants, the monster. The monster. <laughs> Elizabeth shows up with someone else with Frankenstein to get him out of there and the monster says no you go you live we die he we keeps Pretorius dead. with him uh, some kind of doomsday machine has been triggered earlier on and the entire place blows up killing both mm -hmm. monsters and Pretorius we belong dead <laughs> But once again, leaving Henry Frankenstein, who built this thing and started the whole damn movie going, and is responsible for I don't know how many deaths He's by this point. He's the fucking villain. Exactly. He and the monster who really, nothing he did was his fault. It's not like anybody explained to him the rules of life. Right. And how influential have these films been on the history of horror movies? Really, without these films, I don't think we would have horror the way we understand it. Just you, look at the use of light. Look at the use oh, of yeah. shadow. Look at the use of obscurity. It's all about what we can't see. That's the scary thing. You know what I yeah. mean? It's all about waiting for that reveal. When you approach these movies, you can't approach them as horror movies because horror generationally never lasts. It's entirely contextual. So the, the, the monsters of one generation become the playthings of their children. Yeah, maybe it's not scary now, but I can absolutely see how it would be terrifying then. And you know, right. it's still horrifying on a, on a certain level. Yeah, whenever you throw a little girl in the water, it's absolutely. horrifying. Absolutely, and, and just what happens to the monster and how and why he's created. I mean, there's definitely some underlying queerness in that. James Whale who uh, was gay and who uh, killed himself in the late 50s. He, by all reports, was very not out because there was no out in those days, but he did nothing to conceal his relationships or who he was and seems to have been quite accepted by people in, uh, right. in Hollywood. And yet, you know, people will do queer readings into the Frankenstein movies and then there have been other people who've been interviewed who, um, who knew him, who said, no, Jimmy would never do anything like that. He didn't care enough to put it into his movie. So I guess the question is, the queerness we perceive in these two movies, was it put there by the director and the writers, or are we finding that simply because the director was queer? And there is a, a queer aesthetic to, this, to both of these movies, that the, the, uh, the, the images, the visuals, even the camera work are not what you usually see in a horror film. It's hard to pin down, but it is suffused with a certain sensibility that you probably wouldn't get from a straight director. But in, well, bo in both movies, uh, uh, Henry Frankenstein is pulled between his fiance yes. and an older man. There's a, a professor also in the first movie and then Pretorius and his pull is always between the male and the female and which way should mm -hmm. I go? Going back to what you were saying about how the monsters of one generation become the playthings of the next, a modern example would be look at Freddy Krueger, look at Jason Voorhees, Absolutely. look at Michael Myers. They're video game characters. Now they're still they, kind of scary, no, they have but action, they're fun. They have you know action I mean? figures for joke. kids it's and a stuff. Joke. When I was uh, a kid in the 60s, 
Uh, all the Universal Horror films had just been released to television. So people discovered all of these old monsters. But then we had a TV show called The Munsters, which was about a family of monsters. We had The Addams Family. We had endless comic book adaptations of Frankenstein. And we had toys galore, models and stuffed Frankensteins and all these little monsters that for me were scary when I saw them in, in, as, in the film as a child, but were also things that comforted me and amused me. And I didn't discover the images in the movie. I discovered them in comic books and ads for Aurora Monster Models. And the Bride of Frankenstein ad was for me the most compelling graphic I had ever seen. And it repeats in my artwork, in my writing, in things to this day. It is a classic story and two classic movies that actually work best as one if you watch them both back to back. I would agree. And they're both only about an hour and 15 minutes long, so it does really feel like one big movie. Mm -hmm. And I'd also argue that this is one of the rare instances where, viewed individually, the sequel is better than the original when the original was great. Yes. And or, uh, Aliens and um, Terminator 2, Terminator perhaps. 2. And speaking of Terminator 2, we have to remember, this was the Terminator of its day. The effects, the makeup, mm -hmm. The story, I mean, people had never really seen anything like this. And if you like these movies, for sure you have to pick up Gods and Monsters, which is a 90s film with Ian, Mc... Ian McKellen and Brendan Fraser. And Brendan Fraser about James Whale's The Last uh, Couple Weeks of His Life, which is a really beautiful and charming movie. And Young Frankenstein uh, by Mel Brooks from the mid 70s. That is. Uh, not only one of the greatest comedies ever put on film, but it's one of the greatest homages to this kind of filmmaking. So, Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, pretty obvious that we both recommend these movies. Two of my favorite films in the world. Check them out. Thanks very much. I'm Spencer Shunk. And I'm Brad Fraser. That was Old Movies for Young People. We'll see you next time.